going to finish up here with two things. One, 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 one. The news is always bad on global warming. Okay? I like to blame the media. That's such a convenient target. You know, and, and I have to admit, given what you've seen in this talk, I have yet to get tired of shooting these very large fish in this very small barrel. I am not that much of a sportsman, okay? But it's more insidious than that. It has to do with the way that we do science. The way we get money for global warming in Washington is to threaten a congressional committee and say, if you don't do something about this, your children are going to grow up to be midgets. Okay? <laughs> and all the money goes out to global warming. Who's going to write the paper that says this isn't a big deal? Who's going to accept the paper that says this isn't a big deal? And guess what? Your children did not grow up to be midgets, and so Senator X goes on the stump and said, I was told that they would be midgets. They aren't. Vote for me. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the way it works. And that creates bias, because everybody has a self-interest then in perpetuating this apocalyptic bandwagon. My, my profession doesn't believe it. My profession thinks it's unbiased. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case, Mass v. EPA. There were two briefs by climate scientists. One of them was by a group that will refer to themselves as mainstream, and the other one was by, well, the Scots. And anyway, <coughs> this is what the mainstream guys said. They're talking about future work in climate change. Outcomes may turn out better than our best current prediction, but it's just as possible that environmental and health damage will be more severe. In other words, what they're saying is, when we get some new science, there's, no, no, they're saying when you, when you get some new science, there's a 50-50 chance it's going to say it's going to be either worse or better. <laughs> Fine. That seems reasonable. Excuse me. Consider the daily weather forecast. Consider the weather forecast for two days from now. It may say that the high temperature is going to be 88 degrees. Uh, as we speak, weather balloons are going up around the world simultaneously to go into the new, to rerun the weather forecasting model. And the forecast for two days from now is probably going to change. It may go one degree up, it may go one degree down. So that's what happens when you have an objective situation. And they're saying the climate science situation is objective. Yet all the news is bad. How can this be? So I decided I'd test this little hypothesis that my friends made, that a 50-50 chance of it being better or worse. I looked at 13 months of the journal Science and Nature. And I took all the articles on global warming that I could find. I put them in the three piles. It's not as bad as we thought. It's worse than we thought. Or it's neutral, or I can't classify it based on what's in the article. Now, the hypothesis, the unbiased hypothesis, is that each new result has an equal probability of either being better or worse. Here's the answer. There were 115 articles on climate change or its impact. 23 are neutral. We'll throw those out. Nine said it's not as bad as we thought. 83 said it's worse than we thought. If the probability of bad or good is equal, that's like flipping a coin, isn't it? You know what the odds are of flipping a coin 9 plus 83, 92 times, and getting only nine heads or tails is? It's very small. It's less than 1 followed by 10, or 10 followed by 16, 1 and 10 followed by 16 zeros. And so, it's biased. Don't just blame the media. It's my profession, where there is a bias to keep this bandwagon going. Do not kid yourself. Finally, how much is it going to warm? Ah, you know, you'd really stop the money if I told you that we knew that, wouldn't you? Sure you would. Well, we do. Each one of these graphs is a <coughs> climate model. These, uh, these are all acronyms for different versions of the future. For intercomparison purposes, these models are fed a change in carbon dioxide, a change in the greenhouse effect that says it's going to go up, it's going up at 1% per year. It's not. Okay? That number's wrong. In the decade ending in 04, it was 0.49% per year. In the decade before that, it was 0.39% per year. In the decade before that, it was 0.48% per year. So it's got about less than half a percent per year. That number is wrong. These models will produce too much warming. But notice the other thing that they do produce. They produce a straight line. If you average all these models up, you get this black line right here. So they say once warming starts, this is what I talked about earlier on, it takes place at a constant rate. They just predict different constant rates, and they're fed too much CO2. Now, we established that there's a greenhouse warming, because it takes place primarily in the winter, primarily at night, and the stratosphere is cooling. Good. Now can we establish that the warming's been a straight line? And then we will know the straight line that it is. The blue dots are the observed temperature histories. That line could not be straighter. 
So you know the warm, and it works out to about 1.6 or 1.7 degrees Celsius over the next 100 years. I think you're going to live. Ah, but we can't go doing this forever, says the undergraduate. You're right. We need something like the Kyoto Protocol on global warming. So let's run these computer models with the Kyoto Protocol. That's the dashed line. That's the average warming that occurs after 50 years in these models compared to the solid line, which is you did nothing. The difference the Kyoto Protocol exerted on the temperature was seven hundredths of a degree Celsius for 50 years. An amount so small, you could not measure it. But it would cost an incredible amount, incredible amount of money. You know what? I have a better idea for you. If you care about the environment, you will recognize that you can take advantage of a market force. People who produce things efficiently or produce efficient things are competitively advantaged in the market, aren't they? Against their, their competition, against the, in their niche. Okay? And if you have money to invest in those, then the efficient products are going to come to the market sooner because they're going to be more capitalized. Check this slide out. This is the share price behavior over the last five years for Toyota Motor, Honda Motor, Standard & Poor's 500, Ford, and General Motor. People took their money away from those who were perceived to be inefficient and gave it as investment to those who were efficient. Now, I ask you a stupid question. If we had raised the price of gasoline to God knows how high it has to be to comply with the Kyoto Protocol, obviously $2.75 a gallon is enough. Nobody's complying with the Kyoto Protocol. It's not just us. Nobody is. If we did that, though, you would take away a tremendous amount of capital. You would have less disposable income. You wouldn't be able to invest. So it would take you longer to get to that clean future, wouldn't it? And that's what you have to realize. You're for, you are, if you are for the environment, you are for economic development and capital generation, because that is the only way you will get to a cleaner future. That's all in this nice little book right here, by the way, um, which you can buy on this, this, this talk. Uh, I have a new book, which I'm working on, called Hot and Bothered. <laughs> That's actually a come down from the, 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 the publisher turned down my original title for this one because this is an issue where there's an incredible amount of rhetoric and people talk about bigger storms and all that, you know, all this stuff. This is the title they turned down. You know how many books would, would I have sold if they would have let me have that title? Gosh darn, they would have sold a lot of books. Thank you very much.